end of our NFC doctoral fellow talks today with uh, Marina Jumont Gauthier. She's a PhD candidate in the Graduate Department of Art History here at the University of Toronto. And her current research explores the role played by female photographers, as we'll hear more of in the wake of Argentina's photographic avant-garde and its subsequent development in the country and focusing on the works of German board photographers Giselle Freund and Anne-Marie Heinrich and Greta Stern between the mid 1930s and the early 50s. Since starting her PhD, Marina uh, has been a graduate intern in the Department of Photographs at the J. Paul Getty Museum. She also completed a research internship at the Department of Photography at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her doctoral research is uh, funded by OGS and the Joseph Armand Bombardier Doctoral Award. Congratulations on getting that one. Her talk today is called Transatlantic Exposures, German Photographers in Buenos Aires and the Female Lens. I know we're all looking forward to hearing this. I'm also very excited because Marina is now the second person to speak from the NFC this year. We had John McClellan give the Brian Merrilies lecture. It's so nice to see the space reactivated and I think we're in for a great talk. So thank you, uh, Marina, take it away. Perfect. I'm going to start by um, sharing my screen. Yes. We tried this out before, so it should work. <laughs> All right. Oops. PowerPoint. Hmm. Wait. Does this still work? Have we have? Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, thank you, Bob, for describing my project so generously. And thanks um, to all of you for joining us virtually. It is very great to be um, in this room, and I hope that it's only a matter of time before you can experience it yourself and that we can discuss our burgeoning ideas um, in person together. And so speaking about burgeoning ideas, um, let's talk about my doctoral dissertation. And before I get to, into the thick of it and talk to you about my chapters, I thought it would be interesting to um, discuss how I got to that particular topic and why I think it's important. And so my interest in Latin American art and modernism more broadly really solidified here at Victoria College where I was an undergraduate. I'm doing a specialist in art history and a minor in Latin American studies. And I became increasingly interested and somewhat obsessed with what we call the historical avant-garde and in turn um, in the transatlantic crossings between various European and Latin American artists from various um, um, European and Hispanic metropolitan centers that made up a lot of these said avant-garde movement. And rather dissatisfied that the Latin American artists that I was kind of growing desperate to learn more about didn't make their ways into um, my art history classes and the majority, of, the majority of the reading that I could get my hands on on modern art, um, I grew more and more preoccupied um, by the Eurocentric treatment that framed interaction between European and Latin American artists. And so I became well-versed into the history and theory of what we call the modernism of the margins and the resulting proliferation of labels such as alternative, post-colonial, hybrid, and even subaltern modernities. And while I think we are deeply indebted to the scholars, that have shaped these um, theories, in many ways, the downside is that it, they have also, in some ways, you know, reinforced the division of the modern art canon. And so short of coming up with new labels myself with my research, as I think these sort of labels has perhaps, you know, taking us as far as is useful, um, with my research, I want to revisit the idea of, you know, or the importance of the case study as a level playing field agent. And as I will try to show you today, I believe that the protagonists of my dissertations, um, dissertation singular, um, make for particularly compelling case studies, as we do not quite know where to place them in this elusive um, modern art canon. And I find that their trajectories allow us to answer or to attempt answering questions such as what happened when European artists travel outside of Europe? What happens when these artists are female? And what happens when they don't return? And as we will see, um, this is um, especially the case with Heinrich and Stern who will permanently move to Argentina. You know, are they perceived as being German or Argentine and by whom um, do they belong, their works belong to the peripheries or what we call the peripheries or the center. 
And more importantly, how does that impact the way in which we continue to read and evaluate their works? And in, in an effort to answer um, these questions, my dissertation also explores the role played by Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, which is really the fourth protagonist of, of my research. Um, Buenos Aires, a city that was dubbed the Paris of the South around the uh, late 19th century, resisted um, exoticizing stereotypes for better or worse, and we can talk about this later, um, you know, associated with Latin America more than any other of its cities. And so for me, I believe that the presence of Stern, Heinrich and Freund there allow for critical reassessment of how we have come to understand cross-cultural encounters, gender dynamics, non-Western spaces, and the modern art canon. So for the sake of time, um, though my, the majority of my chapters bring um, all of their works into um, conversation, today as I present my chapter, I will focus each one more heavily towards a particular protagonist so that you can get a chance to better understand um, their approach to photography. And so to lay the groundwork, my first chapter explores how Buenos Aires unique set of historical conjunctures allow us to reconsider the durable Eurocentrism of the art canon in more detail. Argentina has, of course, been the subject of innumerable scholarly um, investigation that broadly investigate um, its complex history, its evolving sense of identity, and how the country, but really Buenos Aires in particular, has chosen to validate itself to the world since its independence. And with respect to my dissertation, the work of um, Argentine urban historian Adrian Gorelik is paramount. And so his, his, his account of what he calls the Babylonian metamorphosis of Buenos Aires, which was triggered by mass immigration. In understanding how the relationship between the country's cultural elite and Europe not only informed the former search for a national identity, but also the creative reciprocity between Buenos Aires and its avant-garde. So my second chapter in turn um, examines what is perceived to be the emergence of modern photography in Argentina. Most art historians agree that is, it was Sur, um, an avant-garde magazine founded, founded in 1931 by oligarch and cultural mogul um, Victoria Ocampo that launched Argentina's photographic avant-garde in 1935 when the journal mounted a major exhibition in its headquarters that introduced the work of Argentine photographer Horacio Coppola and his German wife, Greta Stern. And again, the way I chose to describe this event is very revealing of the way it was perceived at the time. Described that by the art critic Jorge Romeo Bres as the first serious manifestation of photographic art seen in the country, the exhibition took place shortly before the couple permanent move to Buenos Aires in 1936. So the pair had met in Berlin, um, when Stern introduced Coppola to new objectivity advocate and uh, Bauhaus teacher Walter Peter Hans, with whom she was training. And at the time of their encounter, Stern was also part of the really great collaborative Ringel and Pitt. Um, and I'm showing you two examples here. Um, and the other member is Ellen Auerbach. So though the importance of the Sur exhibition cannot be overstated, this chapter revisits the idea that it constitutes um, a, the starting point of an avant-garde or a properly modern um, photography in what was otherwise a photographic scene that has been described time and time again as firmly entrenched in 19th century pictorialism. And to do that, I will notably be looking at the work of German-born photographer Annemarie Heinrich. And here are just a few examples for now. Um, Heinrich, who likes Stern, grew up in Weimar, Germany, immigrated to Argentina, with her, to Argentina with her family in 1926, when she was only 14 years old. And in a sea of what is really overwhelmingly um, European photographers who made Argentina their space of exile and or their new home, I find that she um, makes for a particularly interesting, she fills a particularly interesting liminal space as a European woman who first picked up a camera in Argentina. Um, and so I consider different aspects of her practice in the second half of this chapter, um, as I aim to reassess her role in the genesis of Argentina's photographic modernity. And so to go back to the importance of Sur, 
when the first major component of what would become the country's avant-garde forces from Jorge Luis Borges to the painter Sir Solar um, came back from Europe to Buenos Aires in the early 1920s, they were eager to imbue what they viewed as an overwhelmingly conservative art scene with their own sense of the modern experience and to create a distinctively Argentine voice. In turn, if the impetus behind the creation of Sur was no different, the same can be said of the struggle it underwent to reach that goal. In his comprehensive book, Sur, a study of the Argentine literary journal and its role in the development of a culture, John King critically examines the struggle, markedly looking at how the avant-garde journal built on the country's aristocratic past and embodied through its collaborator, competitors, and detractor, the contradictory impulse between European culture and Argentine nationalism that divided avant-garde circles. Though King does bring painters and photographers into the conversation, it is rarely to reflect um, how they internalize the contradictory impulse I just described. However, taking his main premise into consideration, um, we can ask ourselves if the birth, like the birth of Argentina's um, avant-garde photography is commonly ascribed to Sir's 1935 exhibition, in large part because the participation of Horacio Coppola allows this event to be viewed as an Argentine achievement. And though I'm absolutely um, not debating Coppola's a place as one of the most important photographers in the country and an important faction of, of its avant-garde, um, what I am suggesting is that King's account on the difficulty of achieving a distinctively Argentine voice is nonetheless revealing of the preferential treatment given to the photographer. And here I want to take just a few moments um, to show a few examples that would point to the fact that Buenos Aires was perhaps not as firmly entrenched in 19th century pictorialism, and that there were in fact many other um, modern faction at play during the 1930s. And this is a book I came across while doing field work in Argentina in uh, 2019. And um, so you'll have to excuse the quality of some of the slides. And while the pictures are not dated, we can uh, assume that they were taken at some point during the 1930s. And I was able to track most of the photographers um, that were featured in this catalog. And like my protagonists, um, overwhelmingly, they are um, European immigrants. And here I'm showing you Pinero, who came from Spain. And this is a view of Ocampo's Buenos Aires house, um, Anatole Sanderman, who came from Russia, Juan Di Sandro, who, was, who would come to be viewed as the father of photojournalism in Argentina, came from Italy. Um, this is an image from Anima, who is in the, that's in the book, but I was able to find a better version for you. And this picture is not in the book, um, but I'm including it because it's, it's a great photograph by Coppola that was taken in 1927, 1927. And so we can ask ourselves if Coppola was already making modern um, photographs in 1927, then why is the genesis of modernity so firmly attached to the 1935 exhibition? And I think the answer is indicative of two things. Um, on the one hand, the important role played by Buenos Aires's literary avant-garde in supporting the visual one, um, with providing it with different platforms to display their work and advocate their artistic mandate. And on the, and on the other hand, the couple's prized relationship with intellectuals and the literary elite that made up that avant-garde, Coppola's friendship with um, Ocampo in particular. Luis Priamo, who is the most um, well-versed scholar on Stern's work, um, believed that it was Ocampo's idea to put the exhibition together. She was well aware of modernist development in photography, spent a great deal of her time in Europe, and knew Coppola very well. In fact, the latter had actually published in Sur in the early 1930s, back when the journal still included pictures. So not surprisingly, the focus of both the show and the critic was primarily on Coppola. Um, however, the content of the exhibition itself is somewhat speculative as no catalog was produced. And though we can assume that Stern played an important part, the growing significance of the, or the, the, the weight of her involvement um, has evolved along with the recent art historical waves aiming to reinstate the artistic contribution of women. And so in addition to creating the exhibition posters, which I'm showing you here, um, 
Stern undeniably helped pen its Bauhaus-inspired manifesto, and I'm showing you just a short excerpt here um, that discusses whether photography is an art or not, or if that's even a useful conversation to, to have at this point. And so if Ocampo continued to advocate, to advocate for Coppola's career after that exhibition, leading to the production of his career-defining book, um, Buenos Aires, Vision Fotografica in 1936, Stern did not receive um, further endorsement from Ocampo. Um, that being said, the exhibition did help strengthen her place as um, a photographer in the city and cement friendships with many Argentine and European intellectuals. And though her practice was quite reduced during the second half of the 1930s, she had two children during that time. Um, by the early 1940s, she had nonetheless cemented her, her, her place and was a placeholder um, in um, avant-garde circles, really. And I'm showing you here uh, some of the work she did in the, in the later half of the 30s, so pictures of Buenos Aires. This is the very famous, famous book by Coppola that I was telling you about, but she actually um, made the cover. This is an advertising studio that the couple opened together. However, it didn't last very long um, as it was not very financially viable. The taste of the public at that point for modern aesthetic is still being quite tepid. And I think these images are great. And, but what I wanna point, point out here is that while Stern famously never compromised her artistic vision to sort of really sort of please the masses a bit more and, and, and make money off of it. Um, it's because financially she could afford to do that, which was not the case at all with other um, European immigrants that arrived in Buenos Aires, such as Anne-Marie Heinrich. Heinrich had to make a name for herself starting from scratch. Initially choosing photography um, out of necessity, she did not have the, the luxury, especially in those early years, to select what she felt was a more interesting subject or decide if something was worth her aesthetic vision or not. In an interview, when asked if she had discovered her vocation um, in those early years, she said, um, quote, not at all. I had a trade I could live on, which is, something, which is something completely different. Until then, I had never wanted to be a photographer. I just learned a trade because my dad always used to say, one must have a trade in order to survive. I would have liked sonography, something which was almost impossible because I couldn't speak the language. So photography was a good starting point, a good starting place, which I enjoyed from the beginning." End quote. And so considering the ways in which the avant-garde, um, the Argentine avant-garde was primarily an elitist undertaking, um, we can assume that it was Heinrich limited connection, especially in those early years, sorry. Um, that stands as the, as the main reason why her work has overwhelmingly been overlooked from conversation on the emergence of Buenos Aires' modern photography. So given her interest in sonography, it won't come as a surprise to hear that Heinrich was primarily drawn to the world of entertainment and her subjects of choice revolved around dance, theater, and set design. And by the late 1930s, she had cemented her role um, really as the photographer of Argentina's cinematic golden age, um, said golden age, which reached a pinnacle in the late 30s and throughout the 1940s. Um, but you know, how did she achieve such a fast rise? You know? And um, when I asked art gallerist Marina Pellegrini, who's in Buenos Aires, she said, right place, right time. And what she means by that is the golden age of that cinematic avant-garde, uh, cinematic um, golden age and other performing arts in Buenos Aires. And, you know, while Henrik obviously had many competitors, her role as, you know, the photographer of these stars became so ubiquitous that um, if you hadn't had your portrait done by Anima Heinrich, well, you hadn't made it yet. And so how did she achieve such a reputation? And, you know, for me, the answer is twofold. The first is, of course, you know, talent. Um, though she had so many early mentors working um, as an apprentice in various studios, um, Heinrich and her children um, really emphasized the fact that um, she was primarily self-taught. They describe her as someone who worked tirelessly and who did not shy away from experimenting, especially in terms of light. And they recall her beginnings where she worked with tomato cans and other experimental source of lights, you know, necessity being the mother of invention here. And I think the second part has to do with her relationship with her models and sitters, and within that, the growing visibility that the golden age afforded to women in Argentina in what was otherwise 
a very, a still very patriarchally run country. And so Heinrich devoted a lot of time getting to know those who came to her studio. Um, her daughter, Alicia Sanguinetti, said that her mother would, would always say that she was a bit of a psychologist and that she would talk to people who came to her studio a lot before she would sit them down in front of a camera. And for me, the resulting photographs show models that are evidently at ease. I find that there's an inherent respect, a sort of kindship that shines through the surface. And if that's too lyrical for some of you, um, you know, we can trace the fact at least that you know, the best stars of the day and some very important Argentine personalities came back to her studio over and over again. You know, she became their photographers. And I think there was a clear understanding that they were helping her, she was helping them. You know, their relationship was one of equals, not of the photographer over the photographs. And especially when it comes to her nude studies, you know, what we're seeing is not this like tormented, captured muse, which is often a popular trope in art history. So let's look at a few photographs like this one. This belongs to her more um, commercial work, a great example of her golden age um, photography. And what we're seeing here is obviously these negatives that have been like painfully manipulated to make these perfect pictures. Um, and I like to show her hand studies um, because they're there throughout her career. And I like to start with this one because though it is from 1935, it is one of the first pictures that she took really for herself. You know, it was not a, something that she was being paid. It was not a commercial assignment. And what's interesting about this picture is that what we're seeing are actually the hands of a deceased. And the deceased is actually um, Guillermo Pacho Ebeker, who uh, was born in Montevideo, but did most of his life in Argentina. And he was part of this group called Artistas del Pueblo. So, artists of the people, and which was a group that really focused on, you know, reflecting the reality of workers of the dispossessed. And he died quite tragically in his early 30s. And Heinrich was at um, his funeral. And many people have made the point that, you know, she was still very young at that point, and she could have chosen to take a picture of the face of the coffin of the mourners, but what she chose to, to, to pick um, and she was very, very selective, was pictures of the hands because she strongly believed that you could learn more about a person looking at the hands than you could looking at the face. And here, you it's not a perfect pictures by any mean, but you can still see like the blackened fingernails and knowing who that person was for me. When I see this picture, it actually reminds me of Tina Modotti's hands of, of workers. And so this idea of hands and how they can express someone's creative potential and their lives, is something that stays with her. We have hands of dancers, musician. Um, and I like this picture because it shows you just how organized her binders are um, in her archive. And you can see all the places this picture was um, exhibited and also archives are just great. Um, and I really like this picture and it kind of, I think it sort of shows you the range of her um, interest. And I think perhaps for you, this is an easy commercial pictures someone selling cigarettes or even nail polish. Um, but for me, it, it, it's far more complicated than that because for a society that really looked to Europe, to France and to Paris to sort of like emulate this model in Buenos Aires, um, really the liberty that women had in Paris was certainly not the one that women had in Buenos Aires. You know, um, all of the women that I'm talking about today, you know, uh, worked in pants, smoke in public, wore very little makeup, didn't really do their hair. And that was very, uh, frowned upon even in the 30s, right? So when I see a picture like this with a mysterious city in the background, you can assume it's Buenos Aires, you know, what I see is this sort of like defiance, this sort of woman deciding that she too can be a daring flaneuse at night, um, you know, sort of and reversing these, these societal norms. And this idea of, of hens and what they do for the liberation of women comes across um, everyone's work. And I'm talking about that more in that first, in that chapter. Um, she, of course, I wanna say, didn't only um, take, made the portraits of, of features of important figures of the golden age. Um, many of you who come from the humanities might be familiar with the work of Maria Rosa Oliver. And though we are far from the tenants of Bauhaus and straight photography, this is obviously not this like Hollywood picture perfect portrait. And I think what we're seeing is still a very compelling and complex psychological portrait. And I'm just showing you pictures of her at work in her studio in, in 1933. 
And again, I'm showing you her, some of her first nudes because I think they're very interesting. Um, because again, this idea of the liberation of women and the difficult reconciliation between societal norms and pressure and women's relationship to their own body is something to this, to this day in Argentina with abortion rights and whatnot is something that is very um, difficult to navigate. And I'm showing you these just to introduce this brief example because she also had a nude from 1937 that she put in the, the window display of her studio in 1991. And it created such a scandal um, with people calling it obscene and it lasted for weeks, you know, um, even caricatures were produced. She penned an article where she, you know, claimed the right of the nude going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Um, so this is something that I want us to keep in mind, especially as we approach the 40s where women are gonna gain the right to vote. And as we look at, in a few moments, um, Stern Sueño's series. But moving on to chapter three, um, to end to the first half of the 1940s, my um, third chapter considers the impact of the arrival of Giselle Freund. So Freund reached Buenos Aires in 1941 after escaping Nazi persecution thanks to the crucial intervention of who? Of Victoria Ocampo. And this chapter, which I'm still very much working on, uh, maps out the timeline of her photo practice with that of Stern and, Heine uh, and Heinrich in light of Juan Domingo Perón's rise to fame and power and the changing predicament of women during the 1940s. So Stern's interest in photography really aligned with her interest of the human condition. Um, she studied to become a sociologist in Germany. Sociology was still a very young field at the time. And she narrowly escaped to France in 1933, where she completed a PhD at the Sorbonne in 36. And her dissertation looks at the impact, the social impact of photography in France during the 19th century. And, you know, though she was one of the first photographers, as we see here, to experiment with colors, she had no formal training, um, believing that the photographic eye is really what made the picture and that the technology really could do the rest, basically a Kodak ad. Um, and in Paris, it is through Adrienne Monnier, who owned the very important bookstore, um, La Maison des Amis des Livres, that Freund grew her network of intellectual and literary personalities, as we see here um, on the left, such as Victoria Ocampo, who is a good friend of Monnier. And it is in that bookshop that she um, had her first show where she projected these um, colored portrait to you know, everyone that we see here and more. So the creme de la creme, all the Andreas are here. You know? um, and so when she arrives in Argentina, Ocampo became what Monia was to her in France, which is you know, her protector, but also sort of her bread maker facilitator. And shortly after her arrival, Ocampo arranges for Stern to have a show at the association Amigos del Arte, and where these photographs um, were shown. And I'm showing you, this is the, one of the journals that published um, a review of the show. And Freud is a very interesting character because most of what we know about her life comes from her own memoirs. And going through her, her archive at the Emec in France, um, it was really interesting to come across some of the discrepancies between early drafts and final versions and between what she says happens and then coming across pictures that, you know, suggest otherwise. And um, within that, um, there's a lot of discrepancies between her relationship with Ocampo, because while she, you know, acknowledges that she owes her a great deal of gratitude, you know, it was Ocampo that managed to get her a visa to come to Argentina. She bought her a first class ticket when the boat first docked in Brazil, she made sure that someone came aboard to give her food and blankets and whatnot. She welcomed her into her house when she first arrived. And um, Giselle Fern has this very complica complicated relationship with Ocampo. And when she arrives, she's, she really has a, a problem with the fact that Ocampo has this very lavish lifestyle, um, that there's too much food. Um, and you know, she's, it's hard for her to stomach because she says, I'm thinking about my friends at home who cannot eat and I'm having like, their, people are serving me steaks until like, I can't, you know, I can't take it and I have to throw it out. And she says, you know, oh, it would have been very easy for me to make a living in Buenos Aires taking pictures of the socialite of the time through Ocampo, but I didn't want to do that. And 
she decides to go to Patagonia with the funding of who? Well, of, of, of Victoria Ocampo. So there is a tension there. Having said that, when I arrived at the archive, I was very surprised to discover that there are in fact dozens and dozens of, of slides that she took of the most important picture uh, personalities of the day um, in Argentina, even though she says that she didn't want to make this, you know? Um, and this is, a, this is an exhibition that took place at the Museo Sibori in Buenos Aires in 2019 that was curated by Clara Masnata, um, who has a book forthcoming on, on, on Stern. Um, and as we can see, this is just a selection from the archive because as I'm telling you, it was pages and pages of style of slides. And here we see more on her relationship with Ocampo, which is very important. And the projection that we see on the left would have been very similar to the projection that would have been in Paris and in Buenos Aires in 1943 when it was first shown. However, her work is still very interesting. And it is for me really, I argue that it's really in Buenos Aires that um, Freund like found this you know, foundation as a photojournalist. And um, we can see this in the work she took of Stadium. And I have to apologize for the state of these um, slides. Um, it, was, it's, it is very costly to get a digital copy of anything from the EMEC. Um, so we have to deal with um, photocopies for, for, for now. And so, you know, so we see this, the sea of men at football stadium. And in her memoir, she makes this very candid description of going there with one of her male friends who would not let her go by herself. And she describes how she's walking up the steps and she sees this like yellow liquid dribbling down and she realizes that it's urine. Um, candid, but a bit gross. Um, but she does find, you know, where the women are, you know, she is looking for them. And here we see um, this, this family, uh, you know, women section. And here we don't see it very well, but you can see this one woman in the first row who's very enthusiastic to be here. So through her work, we do see, we, we start finding these like slight moment of change um, when it comes to women. Um, and consciously or not, this comes across in her photographs of Buenos Aires. And here um, I'm showing you this great picture of Buenos Aires at night um, and the sort of like growing visibility of women through the photograph, through the cinematic golden age. And I think this picture that's on the billboard is the same, um, the one that I'm showing you here that was taken by Annemarie Heinrich. So, so sort of, you can see that they are in dialogue. Um, and so here a young woman, by a house woman doing their shopping, you know, um, the nightlife of the lower middle class, women and you know and mothers and families and how they build their days um you know bovine competition and here again she finds you know this really one stern looking woman and this is the focus of the of the picture um and i'm not i don't think i'm going to include this picture these this work in my dissertation but the work she does in patagonia is very fascinating because again this is not a place where a lot of female photographers went before or women in general. At that point, it was still quite treacherous to get up there. And I highly recommend that you read her memoir where she talks about how she's the only woman in the ship and the, the, the physical hardship and the cold weather and whatnot, um, you know, makes her a fascinating story and she really likes it. But you can see that she's often out of place um, in these pictures, but she, you know, she's very headstrong and she goes and she does find women there and presents, I think, compelling um, photographs of their realities living up there, very isolated from the world. So uh, moving on, I think, to my fourth and final chapter. Um, in this chapter, I look at the type of photographs that my three protagonists produced from the second half of the 1940s until the early 1950s, as they evolved in an art scene that was increasingly censored. And I want to consider the subversive agency of their photographs and the way in which they challenged um, societal gender norms. And within this endeavor, I look at what is considered to be Greta Stern's most significant or at least her most popular legacy, which is her series of 140 photo montages titled Sueños Dream, um, produced between 1948 and 1951 for the column El Psychoanalysis La Ayudará, so Psychoanalysis Will Help You for the weekly magazine Idilio. Each photo montage accompanied a psychoanalytic um, interpretation of a woman's um, dream. 
and the interpretation were made by Richard Rest, which was a collaborative pseudonym used to cover the identity of psychologist um, Enrique Butelman and his associate Gino Germany, who was the founder of modern um, sociology in Argentina. And the pseudonym was used to salvage their reputation as serious intellectuals now having to make ends meet through a publication really that was devoted, as you can perhaps tell from the cover, to beauty and fashion tips, love stories, um, relationship advice, because of Theron's particular stand on, stance on intellectuals at the time. So trying to navigate their rapidly changing realities, psychoanalytic outlets within mass media proved to be very popular with women, those of the middle class in particular. Um, and indeed the column achieved instant success and even by already by the third issue, they had to, 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 to issue a little warning that said, um, we're receiving too many submissions, so we're gonna have to answer them in order of, of arrival and in urgency of case. And so I'm talking about those because Stern's career going all the way back to Ringel and Pitt was shaped by an effort to redefine women's cultural agency and complicate the image of women as commodities. And as Luis Priamo mentions, her idea of female independence was quite strong. Um, she divorced Coppola in 1943, which was still very daring at the time. And her critical attitude towards the dominant values that constrained and limited um, that independence was very much part of her idiosyncrasies. And to sort of just give you a bit more um, social context, though women had won the right to vote in Argentina in 1947, a right that was famously uh, championed by Eva Perón, who appears in Idilio, um, it remains that women were still facing very complex societal realities, often pulling them into diametrically opposed direction. And interestingly enough, this does um, come across in Idilio where you have pictures like this, sometimes um, on the very next page following the sueños. And, you know, this is, a diff this is a complex topic and I won't do it justice today, but though Eva Perón, for example, believed that women had a, had a place in the fight for social and political change, in her famous book, La Razón de Mi Vida, for example, um, she makes it clear that ultimately it is in the home that women can, you know, impact society. So exposed to really such propagand propagandist views, it is not a leap to venture that Stern viewed um, the Sueño series as a space to critique such social values and custom and the women partaking in them, right? Her depiction are not very kind. And as eloquently put by Priamo, and I'm quoting you a few passages here, here the woman is not shown as a mere victim, but also as a participant in her own circumstances. Women's consent and their own humiliation is one of the most troubling aspects of the series. This complex view of female submission evidences a broader perspective on how the traditional family stifles women's freedom. So while not politically um, uh, political in their, overtly political in their work, all three of my photographers were known to be anti peronist And as we will see though, interestingly, while pictures such like such as this remained undetected by Peron's Ministry of Propaganda, Raoul Apold, um, the work of Heinrich and Freund did not. And here I'm showing you pictures that um, Anna-Marie Heinrich did of Eva Duarte while she was still an actress before she became the famous um, Eva Peron. And that came to an end very quick when, um, according to Heinrich's children, Eva Peron called Anna-Marie Heinrich to say, come to the Casa Rosa, the, the House of Government, to take pictures of my husband, the newly president uh, of, of Argentina. And Heinrich, it, it, it is said, said, um, if Peron wants pictures, he can come to my studio. And that put an end to their relationship. And in 52, when Evita dies, um, Peron's men raid her studio, demanding all negative of any picture she ever took by, she ever took of Evita. And the fact that we still have some today is apparently due to a fortuitous act of oversight on Heinrich's part. And then of course there is Stern, and I won't really talk about it today, famous reportage on uh, Eva Peron that, that appeared in Life magazine in 51. And this obviously broke with the very carefully constructed social image of Evita as a woman of the people. And when this came out, um, Freund says in her memoir that she got a phone call from Raul Apol saying, 
Tomorrow morning, I will be waiting for you at the ministry. Have all the negatives with you. This is an order. And at 7 a.m. the next day, she was on a flight to Montevideo. And it is, and she said that apparently an hour after she had left, um, all airlines had received a clear directive not to sell her any ticket out of the country. And so, and, and then this actually created a diplomatic incident between Washington and Buenos Aires and actually got to the point where Gisèle Fran was declared persona non grata by the FBI and was denied entry into the US um, for many, many years. So to Maybe bring- a couple more minutes, Marina, yeah. and then so we can have some questions. Yeah. So to bring this to a conclusion, um, and see, I'm showing you a bit more. Um, though these women obviously had a very different vision of photography, collectively they portrayed a changing Buenos Aires, a changing Argentina, and a changing Argentine women in many important ways and in ways that I think are very important to the study of modern art and modern photography. That's it. Fantastic. Sorry to call. I didn't, I didn't read it quite right. Thank you so much, Marina. That was an incredibly informative talk. Like, wow. Um, it's yeah, I love I love learning so much about things I didn't I didn't know very much about. Right. And then to see just the sheer variety, I think, is is really something the project you've got here. Um, maybe you can stop sharing so we can see everybody and then we've got some time for questions and um, concerns. Complaints? Yes, I welcome the concerns. <laughs> <laughs> Who do we have here? Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any hands. So it's hard for me to, it's gonna, I won't let you spotlight. Who'd like to go first? Jordan, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Marina. Um, I, I feel like. Um, even though we've talked about this material so many times and for so long, it's uh, it's still thrilling to see you presented in this way. I was 